In this film, what was very specific, it was not about doing good sound, it was the topic was about sound, you know, and how you perceive it. That's Nicholas Becker. He was the sound designer on Sound of Metal, and he's going to talk to us about how he and director Darius Martyr created the auditory illusion of going deaf in Sound of Metal. Okay, back. For those who don't know, Sound of Metal follows Ruben, a heavy metal drummer as he struggles to find his place in the world after losing his hearing. And the film's ability to portray the onset of hearing loss through its soundtrack is just as remarkable as the numerous performances it helped strengthen. That's in large part due to Nicholas's unique approach to sound design. He's gonna fill us in on the absurd lengths he went to record the film's sound library, which included miking preserved skulls, We'll get into his views on creating an audio depth of field by treating microphones like camera lenses. And finally, we'll talk about how he and the Sound of Metal team went about designing the sound of the cochlear implants. But before we get into all that, we need to discuss the copious amounts of research that Darius and Nicholas conducted before the cameras ever rolled. For, for example, Darius called me like one year before the start of the shoot. He came to Paris and we, we spent like one week, you know, speaking about music, sound, films looking at some sequence of, of all the films, reading some literature about how, how you become deaf, perception, you know, un underwater perception. Even at the end of this week, uh, the DOP, uh, Daniel, uh, joined us, you know, and uh, we, we spent like three days to understand how we could combine the picture and the sound to, to create the, you know, interesting point of view for the from the, from the perspective of Ruben. To help the director better understand the sensation of deafness, Nicholas took Darius to an anechoic chamber, a special type of room which is designed to absorb sound waves and create an echo-free environment. Basically, if nothing is making a sound in that room, it's very, very quiet. I bring Darius in that room for, um, and I switch off the light and I let him there for 30 minutes in pure silence and darkness, you know. And when he came out, he was like, wow, you know, he was very shocked because he said like, I was hearing everything, you know, of my body, you know. Like it was like I was inside me, you know. Nicholas knew that those small internal vibrations would be important to selling the physical memory of hearing loss, but capturing those borderline silent sounds was a challenge that would require some unconventional microphones. He's having trouble even communicating with me. I have a lot of different setup of microphone during the recording. It's a bit like a DOP if, if he's shooting with different lens. And, and so everything is in sync and I can move from one recording to another. And it's like changing the perspective, you know, but just like with one single recording. Nicholas's comparison between microphones and camera lenses is an astute one. Good DPs know how lenses change the perception of a scene. If you want to keep only one thing in focus to really isolate that subject visually, a long telephoto lens is the only tool to do the job. Conversely, to convey a lot of information in frame and in focus, only a wide angle lens will do. To create this kind of sound focus, you know, like moving from immersive sound to super focused sound or focused sound to very immersive sound, I have a lot of different setup of microphone during the recording, you know, sometimes like eight or ten microphones from very close up, very detailed. And to get those hyper focused subjective frequencies like the sound of Ruben's jaw clicking, Nicholas used a variety of mics like those used to record sounds underwater, and he even used a type of mic that is traditionally used to find oil. For Nicholas, it was extremely important for him to record natural sounds. You would think those inside the body sounds like the ringing tinnitus or different kinds of white noise would be heavily processed, but they're not. They're all natural, which was important to Nicholas, who was using those sounds to evoke the viewer's memories of physical experiences. I think if you're doing something clean like that, you, you're not referring to other film, but you're referring to the memory of the audience as a person in his own life. If you really build something which is very naturalistic and very true, you understand through a process with your brain or you analyze, you know, it's like your body's like, okay, this is right, you know, I, I know that. And it's, it's a way to talk directly to the body. In this scene where Ruben gets his hearing tested, they did use conventional mics to get the scene's dialogue. Good. Fish. 
but to get frequencies like the diminished internal sound of Ruben's own voice, the multiple versions of white noise, and the tinny sound of the doctor through the headphones, Nicholas used a variety of microphones. You can hear me okay? <laughs> One was an underwater microphone that Nicholas put in actor Riz Ahmed's mouth because the perception of sound underwater is similar to how deaf people perceive a sound's vibrations. When you lose your hearing, you, you get like a solid sound which is moving in your tissue and in your bones and the brain transforms that into sound. It's very similar when you are underwater, you know, because when you are underwater, your, your, your hearing, your ears don't work anymore. But you can feel the vibration on your body and these vibrations are transmitted to, to the cochlea directly. The hydrophone wasn't the only invasive mic Nicholas used to build his sound library. I did also um, a DIY stethoscope mic and you can actually hear everything like the blood pressure, you can hear like the heart, you can hear the movement of the tendons, you know, and it's, it's, it's really crazy. But the strangest recording technique Nicholas used involved a microphone called the geophone. It's a kind of microphone which uh, recording a uh, surface vibration. It's used in the uh, oil industry to um, find oil. You know, they bring like huge, huge hammer, boom, 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 boom. And they put this, this geophone in and they record the echo. To get some of the frequencies he needed, Nicholas attached the geophone to helmets and even preserved skulls to record the muffled vibrations reflecting off those surfaces. And to get all these sounds in the can, Nicholas spent a lot of time recording with Ahmed to get the soundscape just right. At the end of the year, as of the day, I kept his for two hours and I put him all this um, set up real microphones and uh, we did a lot of uh, recording of, of, of him, you know, just bracing, moving his lips, you know, smiling, speaking, bracing, you know, and it, it became like a kind of very important uh, sound library for us. Uh, and to be able to create something, you know, uh, like a, new, a vocabulary, you know, where you, you are able to go 100% inside of, of his body, and then 100% outside, you know? Nicholas went to great lengths to record authentic, natural sounds that were designed to provoke the sensation of hearing loss, especially to people who've suffered from hearing problems. But creating the sound of the cochlear implants took a wholly different approach. When you get like this implant, it's something we have never heard before in the film, you know? It's something like it's a digital world, it's directly, you know, electricity on the nerves, you know, it's something very special. Darius and Nicholas did a ton of research on what cochlear implants would sound like. Here we go. <laughs> Not only did they talk to audiologists who provided simulations, but they also reached out to children of deaf adults about some of their experiences. I did some tests because also there is some uh, CODA people, you know, people which are which, which they born with hearing and they lost hearing. So even if they have they, they lost hearing, they have a reference, a cultural reference of, of sound. So they are able, for some of the CODA who, who get implants, cochlear implants, they are able to, to describe you know, how it sounds. To create the implant effect, Nicholas used audio editing software to separate sounds into different components. I felt like, okay, this is really interesting because the software has like some limits. So for each sound, I separate all sound in these three components, you know, noise, transient, and harmonics. And then after I recompose the sound, so when you try to reconstruct something, it's a bit like a Frankenstein sound. So everything is a bit like off. And it's create a, uh, but you can feel that it's it's actually voice. So it's create a uncanny valley feeling, you know. That audio uncanny valley excels at delivering firsthand Ruben's disappointment from his monkey paw wish for technology to restore his hearing. And as the hearing abled, we completely understand Ruben's dissatisfaction with the results. Not only did Ruben forego a community who accepted him for who he is, but what he got in return was a sense of sound that returned all the functionality of hearing, but none of the beauty. <laughs> Oh, 
What's so interesting about Sound of Metal's sound design is how Nicholas approached creating the soundscape. Just like a director of photography who is fully aware that their lenses can fundamentally change the way the audience perceives an event, Nicholas demonstrated that the same was true for microphones, which was the whole point of the film. It was not about doing good sound, it was the topic was about sound, you know, and how you perceive. There's no better example of the sound design's effect on perception than during Lou's final song at her father's party. Listening to the sweet, hearing able sound of Lou singing as it crossfades, or to stick with camera metaphors, rack focuses, to the harsh sound of Ruben's implant, uses the simple perception of sound to unequivocally show what Ruben lost is never coming back, and the only way to move forward is for him to leave it behind. <laughs> But there is something a bit special about this film you can experience, you know? And there is a bit something like which is not like fiction. It's a bit like, let's say, if, 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 if a, a reality creates a fiction and this fiction tra is transformed back to reality after. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching our chat with Nicholas Becker about Sound of Metal's sound design. If you're looking for more behind the scenes stories, be sure to check out our Goodfellas Art of the Scene featuring an interview with Steadicam op of the Copa Shot. And for more deep dives on your favorite movies, be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV.